Welcome back to the Professional Fangirl. I was off the grid for a while, but now I'm back on a new channel. And I'm here to talk to you about TV, marketing, and you. From Tumblr to Reddit, and Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, everyone's vying for virility. Today I'm going to talk about my favorite shows, the networks that own them, and maybe even touch upon the companies that own those networks. First on the list, if you haven't guessed it, is Warehouse 13. Warehouse 13 was spawned during a time when the Sci-Fi Channel was transitioning to becoming SIFI, or S-Y-F-Y, Sci-Fi. It was trying to shed its old image of appealing to nerdy boys in their parents' basements and expand their demographic to women, who have always liked sci-fi, even before it sounded like a venereal disease. Now Warehouse 13 is in its fifth and final season, with a little help from, well, a lot of help from fandom. In fact, season 5 wasn't even going to happen until a group called Renew Warehouse 13 stood up and engaged the entire fan base and audience to try to get it renewed. And once it was heard by Sci-Fi, they pitched it to Comcast, and Comcast agreed to ha let it have six episodes. I'm not even going to go into the story aspect of Warehouse 13, because season five is such a mess. But I'm going to go into how they marketed the show on the, in the days before it premiered. Their countdown to season five's premiere included outdated photos, which we would love in high quality, but they're outdated from season two, and it featured a bar on the top and fonts in copperplate gothic that was not even smoothed out. Photoshopping skills, guys? While fandom, on the other hand, created countdowns and gift sets that spanned all four seasons to commemorate their love for the show. Why are you making us do your job for you? According to fandom, the Facebook is run by malnutrition dehydrated interns. Finish Friday on a Thursday? You is drunk, interns. You is drunk. They started a weekly tradition called Will They or Won't They Wednesday, which, from a marketing standpoint, went smashingly into a wall called fandom. Will They or Won't They Wednesday asked the audience if a certain couple on a show would make it to the end of the season, say like Pete and Micah or Claudia and Jinx, even though Jinx is gay. We imagined greater and looked at all the possible ships on Warehouse 13, ships being relationships for all you non-shippers, and the results were pretty accurate. But enough about my bitterness. Will They or Won't They Wednesday was actually a great marketing success. It engaged its audience, even though it was bitter engagement, it was still engagement. And why are we so bitter? Well, Warehouse 13 was supposed to be canned in the middle of season 4. The thing is, they sabotaged their own show by putting it in a 10pm slot even though it's a family show, and it's right after Defiance, which was not a family show. Sci-Fi split season 4 into two separate sections that were months apart, so the casual audience who just turns on the TV and watches the show and catches the story ended up missing a ton of story because they didn't even realize when it was on. Kind of reminds me of that thing that happened with Legend of the Seeker when it was syndicated and nobody knew what time or what channel it was on. So a group of fans during season 4 realized that Warehouse 13 hadn't been renewed, so fandom took the matter into their own hands by creating a campaign called Renew Warehouse 13. It was so sophisticated that bloggers thought that it was a campaign run by execs and stuff from sci-fi to try to get the show renewed. But no, silly old baby boomers! Millennials know how to engage with their own demographic better than you. Shocker. Sci-fi has a tendency to cancel shows after season 5. The reason for that is that they pay licensing fees after a certain amount of time, 5 seasons, where they have to increase the pay for everyone involved in the show, and also they have to relicense the product the rights. What happens on sci-fi is I think when you get to a certain number of well, shows... You know what's funny? No one's allowed to do six seasons on sci-fi. Well, there's there's licensing fees yeah. that kick in. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. And so instead yeah. of paying these huge licensing they fees... They scrap the fucking yeah, show. The show. So all the fans are like, but we... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, De we hey Defi you. Defiance fans, yeah. don't get too attached. Yeah. So instead of having to go through all that paperwork and all that increased budget... They instead can the shows and either remake it or repackage it so that it, it doesn't retain the same rights. But if you're a sci-fi fan, S-C-I-F-I fan, you should be better too. 
Back at the conception of the Sci-Fi Channel in 1992, they wanted to dedicate their channel to all things sci-fi. And they did. They ran reruns of your old favorite sci-fi shows, such as Star Trek, the old Doctor Who, and even had Star Wars marathons. Then in 2006, they got rights to distribute Doctor Who, the modern Doctor Who, to the American audiences. The problem with that is they treated it like old reruns of Doctor Who. They didn't make any splash about it. They didn't make it special. They just put it out there for people to see. Which is, if you know the Doctor Who fandom, isn't how it works now when it's on, while it's on BBC America. It's treated as a special event, so much so that it got the Guinness Book World of Records record for um, biggest simulcast for a TV drama. So with that being said, let's move on to BBC America, because one of my favorite shows is on it called Orphan Black. BBC America really upped their marketing game in 2010, which was actually their best year. BBC America started making scripted shows not too long ago, starting with a show called Copper. Orphan Black is a cult hit that's currently in its sophomore season. It has the best fan engagement I have seen in ever. The main ways that Orphan Black reaches out to its audience is through Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram. The latter two which feed back into Tumblr. Why? Because Orphan Black really shot up to notoriety through Tumblr, through word of mouth on Tumblr. So they always treat their Tumblr audience like rock stars. Orphan Black spent about two months engaging with their audience. They had special sneak peeks and interviews with the cast and the crew that they put up on Tumblr, they put up on Instagram. It was usually marketed on Tumblr first, making it a special event that everybody should tune into. And then they would put it either on Instagram or Tumblr. But either way, Instagram would feed it back to Tumblr. And then a couple hours later, they would put it on YouTube and their official BBC America website. This really showed the fans that they were special, that they should continue engaging with the show, making fan art and everything for the show because the show appreciated them back. Orphan Black's gratitude extended so far out that they had a fan event where they premiered the first episode from season two a couple days early for fans. They also had a panel of the cast and the crew and gave away breakfast prizes um, before the show, passed out by the cast of things like Jello and muffins, which makes sense if you watch Orphan Black. They constantly run giveaways and contests on Tumblr so people can win things like Season 1 DVDs, the TV Guide magazine that featured Orphan Black, and Packs of Sugar, which again would make sense if you watch the show. They even give away things like wardrobe from Season 1, such as the class shirt that Sarah, one of the clones, wore, the jacket that the crazy clone wore, and even the jacket that the soccer mom clone wore. Yeah, this would all makes more sense if you watch the show, and I'm encouraging you to do so, because Orphan Black is great. Sci-Fi sells their Warehouse 13 stuff on eBay. They list it up, and if it doesn't get to a certain about amount by a certain time, they actually pull it out and then relist the things. They are making buku bucks with that. I often compare these two shows because they're my favorite shows right now. And while I love Warehouse 13 just unconditionally, that's not true, there are conditions, it doesn't love me back to a fraction of that. While on the other hand, I love Orphan Black. I love it pretty good. And it reciprocates that love tenfold. Love is such a tricky business. Which leads us into our next show, MTV's new original scripted show called Faking It. It's a show that sounds a lot like queer baiting and sexual objectification of lesbians, but it actually isn't. MTV has always been a trailblazer in terms of social justice and social issues and even audience engagement. They have campaigns like engaging their audience, which is the teen to young adult demographic, to do stuff like vote during presidential elections. Sometimes those campaigns can be misguided, but at least they're trying to make an effort. In 2010, a study actually shows that 42% of MTV's programming featured content with gay, bisexual, and transgendered people, which is yay for representation. MTV is owned by Viacom, or Viacom, Viacom is what I'm gonna call it, which, hey, 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 also owns Logo and Nickelodeon. Good job, Viacom. MTV, while originally a music channel, has really been pushing towards 
scripted television for the past decade. Its mission is to reflect the lives of America's youth, and even to hit their older demographic to say, hey, we know what you went through, and media wasn't there for you then, but we're here for you now. There has been a trend towards representation for LGBTQ women in the media for the past couple of years, which includes shows like Grey's Anatomy, Lost Girl, Orange is the New Black, etc. And towards teens, it's stuff like Pretty Little Liars, Glee, and South of Nowhere. So MTV really wanted to hit the demographic that wanted to see representation for lesbian youth, and they created Faking It. The queer baiting question still remains, but it's only been two episodes and it's too early to tell. So I guess we just have to keep on watching. For MTV, I think they are doing something right, and they are trying. And they are marketing well, since they understand their demographic pretty well. So to wrap this really long episode up, we talked about Warehouse 13 and the crap-tastic marketing that it's had, Orphan Black and the amazing fan engagement it's had, and Faking It, which totally hits its demographic. So I don't know when the next episode of The Professional Fangirl will be, but hopefully I will talk about more marketing, talk about more TV shows, maybe talk about Person of Interest, since that's my new thing right now. If you haven't seen it yet, don't forget to check out Forever Destined, which is a new web series on this channel. And if you haven't seen Dashboard yet, you should check that out. And I have teamed up with a Tumblr called The Fangirl Agenda, and we're going to release a podcast probably in June. So stay tuned, follow The Fangirl Agenda on Tumblr, and subscribe to this channel, Change the Rules Productions. And yeah, see you when I see you.